Hello, cool cats and kittens. Just kidding. <laughs> if you've been watching Tiger King on Netflix at all, which I watched the entire season because we are on quarantine and I'm locked in my house, um, you'll know what that's from. But anyway, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, welcome back, English One, to another episode of The Great Gatsby. So, um, I decided to rock this cool Higby hat today, um, in addition to my Higby shirt. My sister pointed out that she thinks that some of you guys might think that I just wear the same clothes every single day because I'm wearing the same thing in my videos, but um, I just want to represent some school spirit. That's why I keep wearing this shirt for the videos, and that's why I decided to mix it up a little bit today with this cool hat. So, um, that being said, let's get back to our Great Gatsby study. So, first things first, I wanted to do um, what I did in the last video and what I'm going to keep doing for every single video, which is at the beginning of the next chapter video, always do a recap or an overview of what happened in the last chapter. Um, I think that th this segment of the video will always be especially useful for those of you who have already read like way far ahead of the chapter we're currently on in the videos. And this must be a good way for you to get like um, just a recap, just a review. And also just in case maybe you missed something. Maybe you're like, oh, I didn't get that. And that, that was like a key part of that chapter. So for those of you who are reading really far ahead or who just really aren't that into watching these videos, just know that um, a very useful part for everybody will be the first like 10 minutes or so of every chapter video from chapter two on because it will always have the recap of what happened in the last chapter. It's a nice summary review. Okay, so that being said, today we're starting at chapter three. So let's first review what happened in chapter two. Let's get out our books, our Great Gatsby books. Okay, so if you'll flip to the beginning of chapter two, you'll know that what happened was we saw um, our narrator, Nick Carraway, um, get to have a little adventure, you might say, with Tom Buchanan. So Tom Buchanan being Daisy's husband. So for some reason, one day, um, Tom decided that he wanted to take Nick into the city. And Nick was like, all right, sure. So they take the train from West Egg to New York City. Along the way, we pass by what is known as the Valley of Ashes, which is just kind of like an industrial waste, maybe a coal mining facility, something like that. Um, and it's very kind of grotesque it's everything is so dirty it's gray and dingy the people who work there are covered in ashes and it's kind of a reflection on the poor working conditions for the working class during the 1920s um, also a lot of symbolism um, we talked about going on there with the billboard of the dr. TJ Eckelberg the optometrist with the big pair of glasses in the billboard um, something that I don't think at this point we know enough about the story to be able to say what it's a symbol for but we can at least recognize because like that's kind of random like why spend so much time talking about this very specific billboard and it's it's like um it's not just like some you know regular mundane billboard it's it's really um unique so it's definitely a symbol we'll figure out what for as we go on um but at this um valley of ashes a little run downtown and we know that there is a mechanic shop and that is where we meet tom buchanan's mistress she is the wife she's also cheating in a marriage um of the man mr george wilson who runs the um uh mechanic garage so tom tells her to get on the train and go to new york it turns out that's what they normally do she normally lies and says she's going to her sister's house we find out that her name is myrtle myrtle wilson so they take the train to the city, and she gets to the city, and what does she start doing? She starts shopping, spending money, um, but buying really stupid things like perfume and lotion and gossip magazines, and then a, like a dog because she thinks that she needs a dog for their apartment they have together in the city. Um, and so we kind of see this as an, probably an allusion to or a reference to the... Um, idea of consumerism that's happening in this era. So remember we talked about when we did our introduction on 1920s America that 
that was a big theme during this time, a big ideal, this consumerism, that people were just spending money left and right. Yes, there was a boom in the economy, so yes, people did have more money, but part of the reason why there was a boom in the economy was because people were spending more money, and people were spending money on credit. This is probably the first time in American history that we have credit, credit cards and loans, which is something that you see very common today. Everybody has credit cards. I unfortunately have credit cards. But um, at this time, people were very, not that people aren't irresponsible with them today, but definitely at their beginning and people aren't really um, like understanding how they work or how to use them. People were overly spending. So she's spending left and right, possibly spending some of Tom's money, we're not sure. So they get to their apartment they share together and Myrtle just starts calling up a bunch of people, trying to start a party. So she calls her sister Catherine to come visit. She calls up the neighbors, Mr. and, Mr. and Mrs. McKee to come over. And we learn a little bit about what these characters are like and look like, which it's interesting because I'll tell you right now that we don't ever see these characters again the rest of the story. So it's interesting that they there, there are so much focus put on them in this chapter. Um, you might start thinking or wondering about what is the significance of that then. I'm definitely curious about that. Um, so the Sister Catherine is described as being very vain, very um, rakish, which we talked about yesterday as being very flirty, wanting male attention, that sort of thing. Um, and the what you might describe her today as a word instead of a rake, because that's the old 1920s word, a word today might be a thought. So you might say that Catherine was a thought. Um, then we have Mr. and Mrs. McKee, who are described as having inverse gender roles. So Mrs. McKee is described as being handsome, which yes, you can call a woman handsome, but handsome is usually a word that's more used to describe a male, right? And beautiful is a woman. So it's interesting that she's described as being handsome. Um, and Mr. McKee is described as being a very feminine. So they kind of have the opposite gender roles. Um, okay, so they have a little party. They're getting, they're getting all drinking. They're getting drunk. They're talking lots of stuff. And, and um, then we see that they're um, becomes a little bit of a fight between Myrtle and Tom. So we see um, Catherine say to our narrator Nick that um, both Tom and Myrtle just hate their spouses. They both just can't wait to get a divorce. And the only reason why they haven't do gotten divorces yet and married each other is because Tom's wife Daisy is a Catholic and Catholics um, can't get divorced. Well, we know that's not true because Nick is Daisy's cousin and he's like, Daisy's not Catholic. So it's in, like, it's, he, he thinks of that as like a lie that um, probably Tom has cooked up to keep his mistress um, from being upset that he's not divorcing his wife. So, um, we also see then a little bit later that Myrtle starts, there's a fight between um, Myrtle and Tom, where Myrtle is saying Daisy's name. And Tom is upset because he doesn't think that um, Myrtle has the right to say Daisy's name. And she gets upset and she's like, Daisy, Daisy, Daisy. And then he just pops her right in the face, breaks her nose, blood everywhere, people getting upset. Um, try, you know, the women are trying to comfort Myrtle and take care of her face. And Tom's like, wah. So in all this commotion, our narrator, Nick, and the next door neighbor slash photographer, Mr. McKee, leave the apartment, right? Normal, getting away from all the drama, get some fresh air, whatever. Weird thing is though, Nick goes to Mr. McKee's apartment with him, um, which is fine, you know, maybe he's gonna go look at his photography, but then we see a dot, 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 which is like, hmm, what is being left out there? Next part was, um, Nick standing by Mr. McKee's bedside while Mr. McKee is in his underwear. And it's kind of like, what just happened there? Is there something going on here? Um, maybe is, is Nick homosexual? Um, if that's the case, that's really quite groundbreaking for F. Scott Fitzgerald to have a main character 
and a narrator, in fact, a narrator being the kind of, of element in a story that the reader inherently trusts because the narrator is who we get all of our information from and who we um, kind of feel like we are in the place of when we read a story. So for an author to make that, that really important character homosexual in the 1920s where that would have been absolutely unacceptable from a societal perspective is really very groundbreaking from a social um, social rights and social perspective for the, the author to do that. So very interesting. So that was the end of chapter two. So if you are just tuning in for those overviews, um, you can go ahead and tune out. If you are here to read along, then please go ahead and get your books out because now we are going to start reading chapter three of The Great Gatsby. Okay, so chapter three, The Great Gatsby. There was music from my neighbor's house through the summer nights. In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings and the champagne and the stars. At high tide in the afternoon, I watched his guests diving from the tower of his raft or taking the sun on the hot sand of his beach while his two motorboats slipped the waters of the sound, drawing aquaplanes over cataracts of foam. On weekends, his Rolls Royce became an omnibus, bearing parties to and from the city. Between nine in the morning and long past midnight, while his station wagon scampered like a brisk yellow bug to meet all trains. And on Mondays, eight servants, including an extra gardener, toiled all day with mops and scrubbing brushes and hammers and garden shears, repairing the ravages of the night before. So every weekend night, Gatsby has some insane parties at his place, and he has dozens and hundreds of people there. Even during the day on the weekends, he has part, he's pretty much partying all day long and having guests over. They're laying on his beach along the shore. They're going out on his boat. Um, they're playing in his pool. Um, he parties so hard on the weekends that every Monday he has to bring in a full-on cleaning crew and repair crew just to repair and clean his house after these epic parties that he has on the weekends. Every Friday, five crates of oranges and lemons arrived from a fruitier in New York. Every Monday, these same oranges and lemons left his back door in a pyramid of pulpless halves. There was a machine in the kitchen which could extract the juice of 200 oranges in half an hour if a little button was pressed 200 times by a butler's thumb. Super rich, right, if he's having hundreds of oranges delivered to his house every Friday and has a butler that makes juice out of all of these oranges. Probably for his mixed drinks, right? He's probably not drinking orange juice for his health. He's probably doing it for his parties. At least once a fortnight, a corps of caterers came down with several hundred feet of canvas and enough colored lights to make a Christmas tree of Gadsby's enormous garden. On buffet tables, garnished with glistening hors d'oeuvres, spice-baked hams crowded against salads of harlequin designs, and pastry pigs and turkeys bewitched to a dark gold. In the main hall, a bar with a real brass rail was set up, and stocked with gins and liquors, and with cordials so long forgotten that most of his female guests were too young to know one from another. So he makes a, a real party scene. He gets Christmas lights all over his um, bushes and, and shrubs and trees out in his, his yard and his garden. He has a full-on buffet table filled with hams and turkeys and um, des like all sorts of designs and foods and all the cocktails you can imagine. By seven o'clock, the orchestra has arrived. No thin five-piece affair, but a whole pit full of oboes and trombones and saxophones and viols and cornets and piccolos and low and high drums. The last swimmers have come in from the beach now and are dressing upstairs. The cars from New York are parked five deep in the drive, and already the halls and salons and verandas are gaudy with primary colors and hair shorn in strange new ways and shawls beyond the dreams of Castile. 
The bar is in full swing, and floating rounds of cocktails permeate the garden outside until the air is alive with chatter and laughter and casual innuendo and introductions forgotten on the spot and enthusiastic meetings between women who never knew each other's names. Sounds, if you, you're all definitely too young to, um, know what it might be like to go to a party like this, but this sounds like it's a real big, normal kind of party. Um, people are, there's a big band, there's a full on band playing music, people are circulating and socializing, but nobody really actually cares to get to know one another. Um, they're just there to have a good time. The women might bump into each other like the way they might bump into each other at the at a, a bathroom of a party today, and they're like best friends, talking about how, you know, just instantly best friends, um, gabbing and having a great time, but they walk away and they cannot remember each other's names. They don't care. They're never going to see each other again. So very shallow um, types of communications and friendships and relationships forming and existing at these parties. Nobody really cares about each other. They're all just there for themselves to have a good time. The lights grow brighter as the earth lurches away from the sun, and now the orchestra is playing yellow cocktail music and the opera of voices pitches at a key higher. Laughter is easier minute by minute, spilled with prodig sorry, prodigality tipped out at a cheerful word. The groups change more swiftly, swell with new arrivals, dissolve and form in the same breath. Already there are wanderers, confident girls who weave here and there among the stouter and more stable, become for a sharp joyous moment the center of a group and then excited with triumph glide on through the sea change of faces and voices and color under the constantly changing light. The night is growing darker it's becoming more into the night people are becoming more intoxicated conversation and laughter is easier and easier and the shallowness of these communications is more and more apparent as girls bounce from group to group to talk and then just move on and don't really care about the group they were just talking to suddenly <clears throat> one of these gypsies in trembling opal seizes a cocktail out of the air dumps it down for courage, and moving her hands like Frisco, dances out alone on the canvas platform. A momentary hush. The orchestra leader varies his rhythm obligingly for her, and there is a burst of chatter as the erroneous new goes around that she is Gilda Gray's understudy from the Follies. The party has begun. So a girl goes out there in the middle of the dance floor, starts dancing, and then maybe people start making a rumor around that she is uh, actually a famous dancer, that she's an understudy for this other fan, uh, famous dancing um, troupe. And then the party really begins. I believe that on the first night I went to Gatsby's house, I was one of the few invited guests. Sorry, one of the few guests who'd actually been invited. People were not invited. They went there. They got into automobiles, which bore them out to Long Island, and somehow they ended up at Gatsby's door. Once they were there, they, introduced, they were introduced by somebody who knew Gatsby. And after that, they conducted themselves according to the rules of behavior associated with amusement parks. Sometimes they came and went without having met Gatsby at all. Came from the party with a simplicity of heart that was its own ticket of admission. So most people are not invited to Gatsby's parties. Um, and Nick thinks that he's one of the only, like the few that were actually invited to it. People just hear about it and they come from all over. And because they aren't actually invited and they aren't actually friends with Gatsby, they treat the party kind of the same way you treat an amusement park. They treat it like it's just there for, for their entertainment. And for, um, and, and kind of like there are, like it's not somebody's house, it's not somebody's personal space, kind of like it's a public space and they can do whatever they want. Um, so that's kind of rude. But also kind of just the nature of these parties. They're not intimate, they're not deep, they're not for serious real friends, they're shallow. They're just a bunch of strangers out having a good time. I had been actually invited. A chauffeur, in a uniform of robin's egg blue, crossed my lawn early that Saturday morning with a surprisingly formal note 
from his employer. The honor would be entirely Gatsby's, it said, if I would attend his little party that night. He had seen me several times and had intended to call on me long before, but a peculiar combination of circumstances had prevented it. Signed, J. Gatsby, in a majestic hand. Dressed up in white flannels, I went over to his lawn a little after seven and wandered around rather ill at ease among swirls and eddies of people I didn't know. Though here and there a face I had noticed on the commuting train. I was immediately struck by the number of young Englishmen dotted about, all well-dressed, all looking a little hungry, and all taking in low, earnest voices to solid and prosperous Americans. I was sure that they were all selling something, bonds or insurance or automobiles. They were, at least, agonizingly aware of the easy money in the vicinity and convinced that it was theirs for a few words in the right key. So he sees lots of foreigners, lots of Englishmen that are here because, right, at this point in time, America is known for the American dream. The American dream being you come to America and you can make something of yourself. There is a fortune to be had. Everybody can be rich if they come to America and they just take it, they just take what's theirs. And it's not surprising then, then sorry, then, that this idea is, um, validified for them because they come to this party where it is clear that there is an excess, an abundance of wealth at this party. And so they're like, well, clearly it's so easy just to get this money. And if I just say the right words to the right person, I'm going to get this money too. So all these people are there trying to sell something. Sorry. As soon as I arrived, I made an attempt to find my host. But the two or three people of whom I asked his whereabouts stared at me in such an amazed way and denied so vehemently any knowledge of his movements that I slunk off in the direction of the cocktail table. The only place in the garden where a single man could linger without looking purposeless and alone. I was on my way to get to get roaring drunk from sheer embarrassment when Jordan Baker came out of the house and stood at the head of the marble steps leaning a little backward and looking with contemptuous interest down into the garden. Welcome or not, I found it necessary to attach myself to someone before I should begin to address cordial remarks to passerbys. Hello, I roared, advancing toward her. My voice seemed unnaturally loud across the garden. I thought you might be here, she responded absently as I came up. I remembered you lived next door to... She held my hand impersonally as I promised that she'd take care of me in a minute and gave ear to two girls in twin yellow dresses who stopped at the foot of the steps. Hello, they cried together. Sorry you didn't win. That was for the golf tournament. She had lost in the finals the week before. You don't know who we are, said one of the girls in yellow, but we met you here about a month ago. So he sees Jordan Baker, who he knows, because he met her at Tom and Daisy's before. And he's like, okay, well, I'm so awkward and embarrassed right now and don't know any of these people. I got to attach myself to somebody I know. So he attaches onto her. And then we see that she has a conversation with two girls that are wearing the same yellow dresses. And they apologize to her for her not winning the tournament, the golf tournament. And they also are like, well, you probably don't remember us, but we met you here a month ago. So that is, again, a reference to the fact that um, these parties are very frequent, they're recurring, and the same people come and go at these parties, but, again, they're not personal. Nobody really knows each other or really cares about each other. Um, they're like, you definitely don't know us, but we met you here. It was like a month ago, and she probably doesn't remember them. You've dyed your hair since then remarked Jordan, and I started that the girls had moved casually on, and her remark was addressed to the premature moon, produced like the supper, no doubt, out of a caterer's basket. With Jordan's slender golden arm resting in mine, we descended the steps and sauntered about the garden. A tray of cocktails floated at us through the twilight, and we sat down at a table with the two girls in yellow and three men, each one introduced to us as Mr. Mumble. Again, the impersonalness, like no person, they don't even know their names. They introduce them and they can't even hear what the people are saying. 
Do you come to these parties often? inquired Jordan of the girl beside her. The last one was the one I met you at, answered the girl in an alert, confident voice. She turned to her companion. Wasn't it for you, Lucille? It was for Lucille, too. I like to come, Lucille said. I never care that I do, so I always have a good time. When I was here last, I tore my gown on a chair, and he asked me my name and address. Inside of a week, I got a package from Croyers with a new evening gown in it. Did you keep it? asked Jordan. Sure I did. I was going to wear it tonight, but it was too big in the bust, and it had to be altered. It was gas blue with lavender beads. Two hundred and sixty-five dollars. Let's pause there for a second. A dress today that is $265 is, in my opinion, a lot of money. That's a dress that I probably wouldn't buy for myself unless I was going maybe to like the prom or like some fancy event. I would never buy that. That's too expensive. But $265 in 1920 was way more than that. Um, I don't know how much, but probably at least over a thousand dollars, maybe two thousand um, dollars, in in today's value because of inflation. Um, that is a lot of money that somebody could one just have and spend, but two spend on a dress, and three spend on a dress that you're going to give to a complete stranger that came to your house for a party. So that's what Gatsby did. So. What kind of man is this guy who has these crazy parties for strangers and then sends expensive dresses to girls that had come to his party and had damaged their dress at his party? There's something funny about a fellow that'll do a thing like that, said the other girl eagerly. He doesn't want any trouble with anybody. Who doesn't, I inquired. Gatsby, somebody told me. The two girls and Jordan leaned together confidentially. Somebody told me they thought he killed a man once. A thrill passed over all of us. The three Mr. Mumbles bent forward and listened eagerly. I don't think it's so much that, argued Lucille skeptically. It's more that he was a German spy during the war. One of the men nodded in confirmation. I heard that from a man who knew all about him, grew up with him in Germany, he assured us positively. Oh, no, said the first girl. It couldn't be that, because he was in the American army during the war. As our credulity switched back to her, she leaned forward with enthusiasm. You look at him sometime when he thinks nobody's looking at him. I'll bet he killed a man. She narrowed her eyes and shivered. Lucille shivered. We all turned and looked around for Gadsby. It was testimony to the romantic speculation he inspired that there were whispers about him from those who had found little that it was necessary to whisper about in this world. So he, Gatsby is like that expression, the man, the myth, the legend. He's like a legend. He has, nobody really knows him, but everybody is curious about him simply because he invokes curiosity. He's a man who throws these illustrious parties, who is so generous and gives to people, who has so much money and has such a fancy house, but nobody knows anything about him. They don't know where he came from. They don't know what he did or what he does for a job. They don't know where all his money came from. They don't know anything about him. So he really inspires a lot of rumors and a lot of curiosity and people speculating on who and what he is. And so he is kind of like a legend at this point. The first supper, there would be another one after midnight, was now being served and Jordan invited me to join her own party who were spread around a table on the other side of the garden. There were three married couples and Jordan's escort, a persistent undergraduate given to violent innuendo and obviously under the impression that sooner or later Jordan was going to yield him up her person to a greater or lesser degree. Instead of rambling, this party had preserved a dignified homogeneity and assumed to itself the function of representing the staid nobility of the countryside, East Egg condescending to West Egg, and carefully on guard against its spectroscopic gaiety. So the party keeps going on. Let's get out, whispered Jordan, after a somehow wasteful and inappropriate half hour. This is much too polite for me.
we got up in it and she explained that we were going to find the host. I had never met him, she said, and it was making me uneasy. The undergraduate nodded in a cynical, melancholy way. The bar where we first, sorry, where we glanced first was crowded, but Gatsby was not there. She couldn't find him from the top of the steps, and he wasn't on the veranda. On a chance, we tried an important-looking important door and walked into a high Gothic library paneled with carved English oak and probably transported complete from some ruin overseas. So they're looking for Gadsby because Nick hasn't met him. Jordan knows who he is, so Jordan's trying to help find him. And in their search, again, this is kind of a testament to the amusement park like mentality that they're just walking around his house looking for him and when they can't find him they just open a door that looks like an important door and they go on in and when they go in they find that it's a library and it's like one of those gothic libraries that has the huge oak paneled shelves and the carvings and very fancy <clears throat> so they go in a stout middle-aged man with enormous uh, sorry enormous owl-eyed spectacles was sitting somewhat drunk on the edge of a great table, staring with unsteady concentration at the shelves of books. As we entered, he wheeled excitedly around and examined Jordan from head to foot. What do you think? He demanded impetuously. About what? He waved his hand toward the bookshelves. About that. As a matter of fact, you needn't, you needn't bother to ascertain. I ascertained. They're real. The books? He nodded. Absolutely real. Have pages and everything. I thought they'd be a nice, durable cardboard. Matter of fact, they're absolutely real. Pages and here, let me show you. So, um, this is to me is very interesting. So they come into the library and first of all, they're just a man. He's not Gadsby. He's some man who's drunk and he's in there in the library and he is very impressed he's overwhelmed with how impressed he is because he's looking at the library and he says the books they're all real these are real books okay so you might be saying big whoop yeah libraries have real books that's where books are at right but um at a time like this where people are concerned with their image and with creating kind of a false image a person who wants to be seen as the richy rich who has a fancy big complete library probably wouldn't care to actually buy thousands of books what they might do instead is have a cardboard cutout that looks like the outside of book spines just as something to cover the big shelves kind of like as an aesthetic like a decoration because maybe most people who have that much money they don't really care to read all those books they're just gonna have fake ones and plus remember this is we have this the kind of this theme of a fakeness of nothing being genuine are people not being genuine or not being real so it's very important and interesting here to note that Gatsby in his library, all of his books are real, not a fake cardboard cutout. He has real books. And this guy is really clearly impressed about that. <clears throat> Taking our skepticism for granted, he rushed to the bookcases and returned with volume one of the Stoddard Lectures. This is interesting because this ties back to what? This ties back to the dinner party where Nick went to Tom and Daisy's and Tom started talking about the book, The Rise of the Colored Empires by Stoddard. So here is the same book. I don't necessarily, I don't actually really know what this means. I can make a lot of guesses on it, but I would say that this is definitely significant that we have a tie back here to a book that was referenced earlier in the book. Remember, the Stoddard book was about race and race purity. So what do you think is being said here <clears throat> by Fitzgerald about race in America? Because remember, the 1920s is a time where people are starting to talk about 
quote unquote race purity because in the, the years surrounding this time, remember, we talked about how we have a <clears throat> blending of races. Um, up until the, you know, Civil War era, era and kind of, you know, after Civil War, we had two distinct. We had white and black, and blacks were slaves. So now slaves are freed, and we have lots of intermingling, and so lots of people who are um, mixed race of mixed racial ancestry and this what we would don't call people today but what they called them in the 1920s was mulatto or colored if they were of mixed racial ancestry and so because of this there were people during the 1920s who were starting to question race purity or the mixing of the races and this guy Stoddard who is based on a real life person whose last name was Goddard had this notion that the white race was going to disappear because of this and was alarmed about this. There was also a guy during this time known as Harry Laughlin who actually is from Kirksville, Missouri who had a very similar idea and who wanted to start a movement known as eugenics in the US. And eugenics was a movement that we could cleanse or purify the genes of the country. And we could do that by sterilization. So sterilization means preventing a person's reproductive capacity. So making sure they cannot reproduce cannot have children. Harry Laughlin wanted to sterilize certain groups of people. He wanted to sterilize criminals, um, people who had any sort of mental disability, and also some people of color. And he thought that this would prevent, and it would purify the race. This is happening in the 1920s and ends in the 1930s. What do we then see happening in Germany in the late 1930s and early 1940s? The same thing which leads to the Holocaust with Adolf Hitler wanting to produce the perfect Aryan race by eliminating what he thought was a threat to that perfect race, which was the Jewish people. So. This is all very important times in world history. None of these events exist um, in a vacuum separate from each other. All of these events are, are linked and build on each other and, and lead to these bigger other things. So it's important that we study the 1920s for, the, for itself, for a look at the 1920s itself because it's a fascinating period, but also because it contains a lot of the building blocks of what we're going to see happening in later American history and in later world history. It's fascinating. Okay. <clears throat> see, he cried triumphantly. It's a bona fide piece of printed material. It fooled me. This fellow's a regular Belasco. It's a triumph. What thoroughness. What realism. Knew when to stop too. Didn't cut the pages. But what do you want? What do you expect? So, this is important. Old timey books, when they were created, were um, made on like, um, like a single roll of paper that would like loop around and to be binded into a book. So like this book would be one entire sheet of paper that was like looped, looped around. So whenever you actually went to read the book, you had to cut, cut the pages. You had to cut up here to be able to open the pages. So it's, this is significant because Gadsby creating his library he went a step far enough to not have a fake library. He didn't make cardboard cutouts for his books. He actually bought real books, but they're still just a prop because he hasn't actually read any of them. And the reason or how we know that he hasn't read them is that he hasn't cut any of the pages. The books are still together where you can't open them. So 
it is just a prop. It's just a created image. But he has taken a lot of effort to create realistic props. That's something that we're going to tie back to later on in the book. He snatched a book from me and replaced it hastily on its shelf, muttering that if one brick was removed, the whole library was liable to collapse. Who brought you, he demanded, or did you just come? I was brought. Most people were brought. Jordan looked at him alertly, cheerfully, without answering. I was brought by a woman named Roosevelt, he continued. Mrs. Claude Roosevelt, do you know her? I met her somewhere last night. I've been drunk for about a week now, and I thought it might sober me up to sit in a library. Has it? A little bit, I think. I can't tell yet. I've only been here an hour. Did I tell you about the books? They're real. They're... You told us. We shook hands with him gravely and went back outdoors. There was dancing now on the canvas in the garden, old men pushing young girls backward in eternal graceless circles, superior couples holding each other tortuously, fashionably, and keeping in the corners, and a great number of single girls dancing individualistically or relieving the orchestra for a moment of the burden of the banjo or the traps. By midnight, the hilarity had increased. A celebrated tenor had sung in Italian, and a notorious contralto had sung in jazz, and between the numbers, people were doing stunts all over the garden, while happy, vacuous bursts of laughter rose toward the summer sky. A pair of stage twins, who turned out to be the girls in yellow, did a baby act in costume, and champagne was served in glasses bigger than finger bowls. The moon had risen higher, and floating in the sound was a triangle of silver scales, trembling a little to the stiff, tiny drip of the banjos on the lawn. I was still with Jordan Baker. We were sitting at a table with a man of about my age and a rowdy little girl who gave way upon the slightest provocation to uncontrollable laughter. I was enjoying myself now. I had taken two finger bowls of champagne and, see, and the scene had changed before my eyes into something significant, elemental, and profound. Pause for a second. First of all, the party is, it's midnight and the party is just still raging on. In fact, it's gotten even more wild and, and people are laughing and it's boisterous and it's joyous and people are singing and dancing and doing acts and it's, it's a crazy party. Something to note though, um, Nick had said earlier that he was uncomfortable because he just got there, he didn't know anybody. So, but just now he says that he was starting to enjoy himself. And the reason was because he had two glasses of champagne and it made the scene change before his eyes. Earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, in the last chapter, when he was going to Tom and Myrtle's apartment and he got really drunk that afternoon, he told us that he had only been drunk twice in his life. And one of those times was that day in that apartment. So now he's saying that he had two glasses of champagne and it made him in a better mood. I don't know if you can classify that as being drunk or if that's just, maybe he's just tipsy. I don't really know where you classify where the dividing lines are on that scale. But if you would classify this as being drunk, then that means that our narrator, Nick, has lied to us. What does that have to say about a reliable or unreliable narrator? Does that mean we can still trust him? Should we believe what he's saying to us? Mm -hmm. At a lull in the entertainment, the man looked at me and smiled. Your face is familiar, he said politely. Weren't you in the third division during the war? Why, yes, I was in the 9th Machine Gun Battalion. I was in the 7th Infantry until June 1918. I knew I'd seen you somewhere before. So he's meeting a guy, he's talking to a guy, and the guy recognizes him from his time served in the war. And this guy is 